1. ¿Comenzamos? Listo, estamos en vivo. Good afternoon. Uh, I am pleased to welcome you to the webinars of the Latin American Association of Magnetism, ALMA, for the year 2021. Uh, today, our speaker will be Professor Ivan K. Schuller from the University of California. And uh, as you know, this event is organized by ALMA, who is an association under construction uh, currently and in expansion. And these uh, webinars are streamed via Zoom and uh, the YouTube channel platforms through the links that you are uh, currently seeing. Um, so far, we are growing with the intention of consolidate the Latin American Association of Magnetism, thanks to the uh, collaboration of people in different countries. And we hope to, to expand this uh, collaboration to other countries and to reach more uh, Latin American colleagues. And I would like to mention Juan Gabriel Ramirez from Colombia, Eugenio Bogel Matamala from Chile, Diego Muraca from Brazil, Jose Matutes Aquino <clears throat> from Mexico, and Juan Adrián Ramos Guivar uh, from Peru. During the year uh, 2020, we started with this program of webinars during the second part of 2020, and we had so far uh, four webinars one by Marcelo Nobel from Campinas, one from Miguel Novek from Rio de Janeiro, one from Miguel Kiwi from Santiago de Chile, and one from Marcela Fernandez Van Rapp from La Plata, Argentina. And you have here the links uh, in order you can watch uh, these uh, webinars. During 2020, we had uh, created a few uh, committees of ALMA, in particular, the committee of webinars. And during 2021, uh, Professor Paula Berkov will be the coordinator from the University of Cordoba, Argentina. And this committee who is uh, planning and contacting the speakers is composed by Fabia, Flavia Gomez Albarracin from Argentina, Fernando Luis de Araujo uh, Machado, and Maria Eugenia Forte Brollo from Brazil, Rafael Gonzalez, Juan Gabriel Ramirez Rojas, Anoska Moscoso from Colombia, Alejandro Riveros and Felipe Torres from Chile, and Israel Betancourt from Mexico, and Juan Adrián Ramos Guivar from Peru. <clears throat> We have planned to have a webinar each month during uh, 2021. And the next one will be on March 26 uh, by Adriana Figueroa from Catalonia on the subjects Spintronics in Topological Insulators and 2D Materials Interfacial Phenomena. Now I will give the time to Dr. Felipe Torres from the University of Chile uh, and the Center Sedena, who will introduce our uh, today's speaker. So thank you very much to everyone. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Kike. And welcome everybody. I want to thank the organizers for the invitation to be chairman in these sessions. It's a great honor to present the Professor Ivan Schuller. Dr. Ivan Schuller is a distinguished professor and director of the Center for Advanced Nanoscience at the University of California, San Diego. He is also the director of Energy Frontier Research Center on Quantum Materials for Energy Efficient Neuromorphic Computing, fellow of the American Academy of Art and Science and chair of the B Center for Memory and Recording Research. Professor Schuller is a member of many scientific 
scientific and advisor committees for Nanoscience Center in Spain, Chile, Colombia, United States. He is the president of four of the trustee and chair of the Scientific Advisor Board Instituto Madrileño de Estudios Avanzados Nanociencia, chair of the Scientific Advisor Board of the Center for the Development of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology in Chile, member of the Scientific, uh, Scientific Advisor Panel of Growing Center for Cognitive Systems and Materials in Holland, Advisor Council in Nanotech Nexus, a member of the International Advisor Board of Korea Magnetic Society. His research interests are neuromorphic computing, superconductivity, nanoscience, nanomagnetism, magnetism in organic molecules, and complex oxides. The pioneer Professor Schuller's works on superlattice has mentioned in the justification of the 2007 Nobel Prize as a precursor to the discovery of giant magnetoresistance. He has published about the 6,000 600 papers, receiving more than 35,000 citations, 20 patents, and five book chapters. He has given more than 350 invited lectures and international conference. Um, Professor Schuller is an extensive, extensive science-related outreach and artistic activity. He has given many public lectures worldwide in museums, TV, about science. His movie, When Things Get Small, centered on nanoscience, has won five regional Emmy to Telly and won first place Gold Camera Award and second place in Professional Film Festival. He also brought a play called Copenhagen Project. Professor Schuller has won major science prizes, including the U.S. Department of Energy Outstanding Accomplishment in Solid State Physics for determination of the structure of a high temperature ceramic helium barium copper oxide, American Physical Society with Whitley Award, for the dedication to the development of physics in frontier, in frontier level in Latin America, China, and, and India, Alexander von Humboldt, uh, Material Research Society Medal, American Physical Society Adler Award for research in metallic superlattice, communicated with unusual enthusiasm and eloquence, U.S. Department of Energy Lawrence Award, International Union Materials Research Society SOMI Award, Corresponding member of Academy Science of Chile, Belgium, Spain, and Colombia, IEEE Magnetic Society Distinguished Lecture, Royal Suite Academy Laced Magnet Award, Award in 2015 for, for his contribution to physics and particularly for creating the field of metallic superlattice, U.S. Department of Defense Vannevar Bush Fellow for a bio inspired functional hybrid, a new paradigm for solid state device. American Academy of Art Science and the American Physical Society in March meeting for the lecture on neuromorphic computing. Today, Professor Schuller will talk about magnetism in proximity. Now, floor is yours, Professor Schuller. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Felipe, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I hope that this uh, introduction doesn't come out of my time. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to, I, I will spend the, the next 40 or 50 minutes talking, so uh, do not make the discounts for this very lengthy introduction. I, I thank you very much, Felipe, for uh, this. Uh, so I will share my screen now. Uh, please let me know if um, when I share, you can see it. Can you see my screen? I need somebody to tell me whether- Yes, 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 yes. yes we can see your screen. And, um, I will go into the into um, see if I can eliminate this. Um, okay, so now comes the key question. Uh, went to option. Okay, now now I'm in business, I guess. Can you can you see my pointer? Yes. Okay, good, excellent. So um, okay, so um, what I will try to tell you about today is about a general idea of magnetism in proximity. This has guided much of my work during most of my life, and uh, it's taken different kind of um, uh, different type of uh, 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 forms. Uh, one of them was in metallic superlattices that it was alluded already, which was ferromagnetic normal material. Then giant magnetoresistance, which was tri-layers of a ferromagnetic and normal and a ferromagnetic material. Exchange bias, which is what I will tell you mostly about today, which is a interface and a 
proximity between a ferromagnet and an antiferromagnet. And, uh, and uh, what I will tell you is about maybe, if I get to the end, probably not, but ferromagnet and materials that undergo a metal insulator transition. Now, generally, many of the things that I will tell you about are, uh, are uh, um, many of the things that I will tell you about are, um, sorry, I, I, I have a problem here because uh, every time somebody logs on, um, uh, uh, they, they, they appear on my screen here. Sorry, um, not worry. I am admitting them. So you can continue and we'll take care of that. Thank okay. you. Okay. So, um, so uh, uh, many, of, many of the people believe that the, the reason to do magnetism is because of applications. I will t tell you mostly about science, but there are applications and all the applications, so to speak, is not that old, but it is ongoing, is in spintronics, which is a new field. Uh, did not exist when I started working on metallic superlattices. And nowadays there is this um, field of neuromorphic computing, which is also a, is a new field that is taking off like a rocket ship. If you're interested in some of the work that I will describe here, it's available at these two websites. And you can just, uh, if you Google me, you don't even have to write down these websites, but if you Google me, you will find it. So, um, now, okay, so what I want to argue with you is that the proximity between dissimilar ma ma materials uh, makes them very, very interesting. And that's what I will try to present to you an example of that today. So I'll give you just an example as a motivation, a teaser. So look at the following situations. Suppose I take a material, which is, I will describe it later on in, uh, as, as I go along, but. I take a material which is an antiferromagnet for the purposes of what I'm gonna tell you now, you don't need to know even what an antiferromagnet is. It's some kind of a magnetic material and I put a ferromagnet on top of it. If I put a ferromagnet on top of it in a magnetic field that is pointing towards the right on your screen, the ferromagnet has its moment pointing to the right. And what I will do is in this particular material, I will simply uh, decrease the temperature. Okay, that's all I will do. So here it is, what happens when I decrease the temperature. Now, the only thing that you have to know is that the Curie temperature, the ordering temperature of the, of the, uh, the, the Curie temperature of the ferromagnetic material is, um, is much higher than the ordering temperature of the antiferromagnet. Okay. Uh, Okay, and now what I will do is I will cool this material down as a function of temperature. And here it is something very unusual that happens. I'm plotting here the magnetization of the material as a function of temperature. As you are, as you are cooling the material down, suddenly the magnetic moment of the magnetic material does something very unusual, something totally unexpected. It opposes the actual magnetic field. Notice I have not changed the magnetic field and the, and the, the, uh, the, the ferromagnet now points towards the right, although the magnetic field keeps on pointing to the, le to the, to the right. So the, magnetic, the, the ferromagnet points to the left now. If I heat it up again, at some particular temperature, the thing uh, uh, points back again along the field. So the magnetic moment of the ferromagnet in a fixed magnetic field changes direction as I'm pulling it down. Now, this is, was uh, purposefully engineered, and actually this is not a random thing that this happens all the time, and that's what I want to tell you about it. It is a very kind of unexpected effect that the ferromagnet orders opposite to the magnetic field. Now, one of my favorite authors is Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Uh, well, in fact, probably Diff, my favorite author, and it's very appropriate for this talk here. So I want to tell you is that, that, that what happens here, the talks in the time of the COVID, which was a title of a famous book by uh, Garcia Marquez. So the first thing is, can you please hear me? Please let me know if you can hear me. I would like to have a verbal, and if you, if you cannot hear me. Yes, then, yes, yes, yeah, yes. Please notice it. Then interrupt me anytime. Yes, yes. Please interrupt yes. any time. So I, uh, so, so just in case uh, uh, I, I, I lose it. Uh, please ask questions. 
And let me just point out to you that I will finish on time. I am a professor and I know how to finish things on time. So I will, uh, I will surely finish on time. So I need your feedback because I'm talking to my screen here alone in my room. And so therefore that's very difficult actually uh, to do. So what I will tell you is about exchange bias, which is basically as I alluded before, is the proximity between an anti-ferromagnet and the ferromagnet. Again, my name is Ivan Schuler. I'm at the University of California, San Diego. And I have to acknowledge that the Department of Energy has been funding much of my work in, in magnetism for many, many years. Now, at the end of the talk, I will show you that it oh, is very- Hello? This is the uh, I'm not sure, uh, are you talking to me or? Yes? Okay. Oh, one. One uh, so at the end of this talk, I will, I will show you that it is very important to understand local details of what's going on. And it is not just kind of a general thing that one can write general equation for everything known to man. And the key point here will be, is where are the uncompensated pinned spins? Now, I will not tell you the details of this, but I want to emphasize to you that the details are important, that they cannot be neglected. I had many collaborators over the years. Uh, all I want to point out at this moment is uh, uh, Pavel Lapa, who's uh, probably looking for a job, and some of you may have a job. I had collaborators at UCSD. I had collaborators at the national labs. I had collaborators internationally and in Germany and in Spain and in Catalonia and uh, in the US and uh, in Israel. So this has been a very collaborative kind of a work. And for the young people in the audience, I want to tell you, we are living very exciting times, never mind the COVID, but we are really living very exciting time. There's a lot of interesting new science that can be done. There is much to do and it may even be useful. And some of the things that I will tell you ended up being useful. Um, so, I'm always looking for some good young collaborators and contact me if you're interested. In, uh, UCSD San Diego it looks like this, so it's not the worst place in the world to live. And uh, if you really are interested in science in addition to surfing, then you know we have some equipment that has lots of screws and knobs and things. And so we even have clean rooms, state-of-the-art clean rooms that uh, allow us to do whatever we want to do. Now, as I told you, typically, uh, people justify this kind of a field by their applications. And there are certainly there are applications. There are magnetic random access memories that already exist. There are of course hard disk drives. And what is uh, going in the direction of uh, probably of important application is what is called neuromorphic computing. Uh, all these devices and all these uh, uh, applications rely on this device which is a device that has four layers. It has two magnetic layers, one magnetic layer here and another magnetic layer separated by something that is non-magnetic and next to a material, which is what I call an antiferromagnet, which has a moments alternately pointing in different directions. Now, I will tell you about the science of this. I will spend very little time about applications. And so, I, although applications are important and application people are, are uh, are uh, interested in applications, I will not tell you much about it. Now, the, you must have heard many, many times about this thing, which is this, the resistance as a function of magnetic field of the tri-layer, this magnetic, magnetic separated by a normal material, it has a high magneto resistance, high resistance in zero field, low resistance in high field. This is what is called the phenomenon of giant magneto resistance, magneto resistencia gigante. This gave rise to another device, which is this device, which is now being used actually in neuromorphic computing. Uh, this is a, what is called a spin torque oscillator. And this spin torque, uh, this spin torque oscillator is also a three, three layer device. It's, a, it's let's say for instance, a, a two cobalt layer separated by copper. If you put a current through this device because of the coupling of the magnetic moment of the current to the spin, one can turn around the magnetic moment of one of the layers with respect to the other, which gives rise to a resistance, gives rise to oscillations, and is actually nowadays used in neuromorphic computing. But I, so these are the so-called spin torque oscillator devices. 
What I want to tell you is about the other layers, these two layers that invariably should be there into any of these devices. And there is not that much talk about it when, when actually it's applications, when, when people talk about application, that actually it's very, very interesting and the properties of it is very interesting. And not only the properties are very interesting, they are crucial to the development of the devices. So what I'm gonna tell you is about what is called exchange bias. So here I am plotting the magnetization as a function of magnetic field for this bilayer of these two materials. And uh, the reason that this is interesting because this bilayer does this very strange thing. It's sometimes the magnetic hysteresis loop M versus H is shifted to negative values. Sometimes it's shifted to positive values. And sometimes there's even two steps in, the, in, the very, in one single magnetic materials. And that is all related to what happens here at this interface. And that's what I want to tell you today about. And that's what kind of gives you the motivation of why one wants to work on two materials in proximity. The reason is that they do something which is different from what they would do if they are alone. Now, the explanation of this thing is very simple. In a ferromagnet, you have a magnetization versus a hysteresis. You have this so-called hysteresis loop, and the magnetization versus field has this, this form here. Now, if you put this ferromagnet next to an antiferromagnet, because of the interaction at this interface, the hysteresis loop shifts to negative values. This is what is, uh, uh, because it's like an internal field. It increases the coercive field and it takes a large, it shifts by a large amount uh, called the exchange bias field. This is what is called the, the phenomenon of exchange bias. And this was already discovered in 1957 by Michael John and Bean. Now you ask yourself, 1957, why would Ivan Schuller work on this field in 1950, that was discovered in 1957? This is all understood. And what I want to argue with you that it is not all understood and there is still some very interesting and important issues that to deal with. So I asked myself the question, when this was done in 1957, where was I in 1957, 64 years ago? Well, 64 years ago, I happened to be in this place here. This is a town where I was born. Uh, it's called Cluj. Now, I, I, I look a little bit older now than when I was born. So that's me again in front of this statue here in my hometown. It's called Cluj or Kolozhvar or Klausenburg. And that's the corner at which I was at some moment of my life. When I was a little boy, I was looking at the tower. You see the same tower there. And I was talk, walking around with my father and my father asked me, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a physicist. That was roughly when the Sputnik went up. And uh, I don't know if that was the reason, but that's what I wanted to do. And so since then, I obviously was destined to agonize over this phenomenon of exchange bias. So here it is a surprise. Let me just show you first a surprise about this phenomenon of exchange bias. Here it is the number of publications as a function of time uh, uh, until about 2011, 10 years ago. And I did a study of this. And then you see, uh, I started working at that point in time. And as you can see, the, the number of papers was growing exponentially. So I decided, okay, in 2050, everybody will be working on exchange bias. And so therefore, this will solve the unemployment problem. And so we can go to something else. To my great disappointment, after 2016, this became flat and there's only about a thousand um, uh, uh, papers and citations per year. So it's, uh, it leveled off, so it doesn't grow exponentially as I was hoping in 2010. Now the explanation, as I told you, is deceptively simple. You have an interface, the interface applies an internal field and, uh, and uh, uh, that's it. But there are some fundamental issues, for instance. Sometimes this phenomenon is reversible and, and sometimes it's irreversible. Sometimes you need training. You can put it through several loops and it changes. One can control this phenomena. There is this issue that, which I will address later on during my talk, which is the pinned uncompensated spins. There is all kinds of interesting fast time dependent phenomena which are not well understood. And I want to leave you with this message that no theorist, to the best of my knowledge, can predict which systems will show exchange bias and which systems will not show exchange bias. That is still a sort of fundamental 
kind of a puzzle and no matter how much density functional theory you do, no much how much theory you do, so far nobody can predict what is the magnitude and in which systems you see exchange bias and which systems you don't. By the way, uh, at this stage of the game, I would like to ask you again, can you hear me and can you follow my talk? Can you please give me a feed, some feedback? Because I have no idea if I'm talking to the wall here. Can somebody? It's okay. Yes, okay. Hola, sí, se ve bien, se escucha bien. Hola, Javier. Eso es lo que quiero asegurar. Point bomb. Okay. So, so the question is, how universal is all this? So look, I, I have worked on this field quite a bit. I mean, I'm telling you, I wrote lots of papers and lots of different systems. And, and I was asking myself, why is it that there is so much controversy in this field? Now, the reason that I believe there is so much controversy because although Michael John and Bean kind of looked at it and is deceptively quite simple what, they, what, the, what uh, the explanation for this is, um, uh, uh, as uh, my old president, uh, my old last Republican president, not the last one, but the one before the last one said, this is irreducibly complicated. We cannot understand anything. So that's, those are the two extreme viewpoints. And I want to argue with you that the reason that there are those two extreme viewpoints is because different people make different kinds of measurements. And then the different measurements give you an indication of what's going on. However, those indications that you get are partial indications of what you, what you uh, uh, are interested in understanding. And, and this is not possible by doing just one kind of measurements, which uh, there is a tendency in physics to do, which is, uh, you know, this is called an, an it's, it's called an elephant. It's like an exchange bias elephant. And this, because uh, this reminds me of an old uh, uh, Indian story that said that, so six blind men of Hindustan disputed loud and long, each of his own opinion exceeding stiff and strong. Though each was partial in the right, they all were in the wrong. And the reason for this is because different people look at different aspects of this problem and they don't look at a comprehensive study of it. And so the person that looks at the, at the tail, they think that this is like a snake. The person that looks at the legs, it says like it's like a tree. The people that looks like the ear, it thinks like it's like a, like a piece of paper. So, so the, the thing is that you cannot do this kind of experiments. You see, everybody wants to do this kind of experiments. These are so-called hit and run experiments. You do a very fast experiment, you solve the problem, and then you go and get the Nobel Prize and you do next something else. You cannot do in this field these kind of problems. And the reason you cannot do this is because systematic studies are essential. And systematic studies have to be quantitative. For instance, the structure has to be quantitatively determined. They, you have to vary one parameter at a time. A lot of people tend to take very too many parameters at the same time. Different measurements on the very same samples, because this is very sample dependent, and reevaluate even the well accepted facts. And I'm saying this for a young people do not believe everything that are told well accepted facts, reevaluate them and make sure that you agree with them. And there are many surprises, and that's what I want to show you now here. So, why care about the structure first? Well, let me just give you. The reason that you want to care about the structure, I will tell you something which is not very popular in this field, that nothing is perfect, nor as expected. People think that they can make perfect materials. You cannot. And the next thing that I want to tell you is that small structural changes give big effects in the physical properties. So let me just give you an example in magnet. Let's say we take the 110 FEF2. This is a compound, it's an antiferromagnetic compound and we take that surface. So there it is how the 110 FEF2 surface looks like. There are four spins pointing down in the corner and one spin pointing in the middle. These are only the iron spins. The, the, the fluorine spins are somewhere in between there and they are providing the glue to stick all this together. This is an antiferromagnet because if you, if you look at the spins here in the corner, there is a quarter of a spin pointing down and four times a quarter is one pointing down and there's one spin pointing up. So this is a totally compensated magnetic material, but it has some spins pointing down and some spins pointing up. Now what happens if you grow this material on a bulk FEF2, you put some zinc fluoride, which is non-magnetic, you grow this FEF2 
and you go this exchange bus uh, iron on top of it, you have this structure. So that's the structure of the interface. You can grow this differently. And it's called an untwinned structure, a single crystalline structure. You can grow this FEF2 on top of magnesium oxide. And then if you grow it on top of mag magnesium oxide, there are two possible orientations as I shown next to my laser pointer there. This is called a twin. If you, instead of growing it on top of uh, magnesium oxide, you grow it on glass, then you get all kinds of orientations. They are still one, one, zero oriented perpendicular to the layer. However, in the plane, they are random. And each one of these polycrystalline in the plane have different uh, properties. So the structure is complicated. It's not simple in all these materials that we make with these very fancy kind of techniques. The other thing is that the interfaces are not perfectly flat like people would like you to believe. And so the interfaces, there is roughness and all kinds of complications that you have to worry about. You cannot forget it. So structural measurements are important and you must measure the structure after the synthesis, not before the synthesis, okay? So you synthesize the material, you have to measure it and measure it quantitatively. And the reason for that is because there is uh, many, many what are called red herrings in, in English, uh, in Spanish or Portuguese is pistas falsas, which can give you, can mislead you into believing things that are not, uh, uh, that are not correct, okay? So, so for instance, let me give you an example. Suppose you take a permaloy, that's an alloy of nickel and iron, and you put it on top of vanadium oxide, V2O3. That is an antiferromagnet that has an antiferromagnetic transition at around 165 degrees. Now, if you look at the hysteresis loop at 150 uh, degrees, there it is the moment. And, and, and what you would expect is that as the vanadium oxide becomes antiferromagnet, the hysteresis loop switches to the right. And in fact, it does that. It, the hysteresis loop, as you will see, as I'm showing it to you here slowly, it switches to the right. You can see that it's moving towards the right, but it's doing something weird. It's not only switching to the right, it's switching upwards also. So what the hell is going on? So this is something totally unexpected that it switches upwards. Well, it turns out this is a red herring because if you grow the permaloy, then you grow the vanadium oxide and you grow another layer of permaloy on top of it. If you look at the lower layer, at the lower interface right here, that layer, with, you can do this optically. So this is done with the, what is called a magneto-optic care effect. Then you see the hysteresis loop is shifted to the left and shifted outwards. But if you look at the upper layer, that is also coupled to the very same vanadium oxide is not shifted at all. Now, the end of the story turns out this is a red herring. The reason that this is a red herring is because of that interface, because of growth reasons, because of growth reasons, there is a formation of an iron oxide interface, which is totally unexpected. So the layers don't look like you think they look like. And all this is due to the formation of this uh, red herring or this iron oxide uh, phase, which is uninteresting, actually. It turns out to be completely uninteresting. So you have to be very careful of that. And it is not that I don't have in my lab expensive equipment. I have every expensive equipment you possibly can imagine. I do have it in my lab, but nothing is perfect. Every time I grow something, there is all- Ivan, sorry? Yes. Can I interrupt? Yes, please. I was, uh, I was asking uh, why it's going up? Why is the reason why it's going up? The, why is the, reason, no, the reason it's going up is because it forms this iron oxide layer, which is a ferromagnet. And so that as you are as you are uh, 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 as you are cooling it down, the iron oxide ma uh, magnetic layer starts taking off the uh, starts taking on the signal. Okay, so there is a magnetic oxide layer which has the transition temperature around the very same transition temperature of the vanadium oxide, and therefore there is a magnetic moment that goes up, which is the magnetic. Okay, okay, and increases. Okay, thank you. That's all that you are seeing. So it's kind of a, an uninteresting thing. Okay. It, but it masked by this all complicated thing and all the structures. So you have to be careful. That's all I'm saying. Okay, so all materials have disorder if you measure them properly. That's what I want to argue here. Now, it, uh, actually, this led to Axel Hoffman, who was one of my students at some moment of life to put this in his thesis. A member of my crew must be tough, ruthless, and never give up, even when things look completely hopeless. So what, what makes you think you qualify? And he said, I worked with Ivan Schuller. So that's what I'm telling you here is you have to work very hard and many of the students don't like to do this. 
Now let me show you what happens if you take an exhaustive system. By, by an exhaustive system, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I will take a, a material which is an antiferromagnet, which is an XF2, an antiferromagnet, and I'll put different, uh, I just noticed it that I, I have a mistake here. This should say antiferromagnet, and I put on top of it different kind of magnetic materials, ferromagnetic, non-ferromagnetic materials, all them on top of it. I grow all this by high, high vacuum evaporation, and I characterize them ex situ, in situ. I can make polycrystalline, twin, the epitaxial, everything done. So this is a very, a very um, interesting kind of a system. And the ferromagnetic component here can be iron, so it can be, uh, um, uh, sorry, the, the, the ferromagnetic component here, the X can be either iron, manganese, zinc, cobalt, nickel. So it's a very, very uh, exhaustive system and it has different kind of, slightly different kind of magnetic properties so one can follow the whole thing uh, around, okay. This was uh, first introduced in my lab by David Lederman, who's now at the University of California in Santa Cruz. So the advantages of this is that it's easy to grow. It has a controlled crystallography. We can grow it polycrystalline, twin, single, as I showed you before. We can grow it along the 110, 100, 211 directions. It has different anisotropies. There's a non-magnetic control, which is zinc difluoride, and it has a lot of transition temperature, so it's completely useless. So here it is the mechanism that you would expect. The mechanism that you expect, as Michael and, John and, Jean, uh, Michael, John and Bean explained to us, is you take a ferromagnet, which points towards the right, and uh, at some temperature, which is below the Curie temperature of the ferromagnet, you cool it in a magnetic field, and you cool it below the nail temperature of the antiferromagnet. The antiferromagnet orders, and because of that interface there, the antiferromagnet applies an internal field on the ferromagnet. Because of this, the hysteresis loop shifts towards the left. It's like adding an extra field. So the field is really not zero, it's something else. And so the hysteresis loop is shifted towards the left. And so let's see what would one expect. This is the original explanation by Michael Lowe, John and Bean. So, so what would you expect? What you would expect is basically four things. You would expect that the, the, the exchange band should be maximum for uncompensated surfaces. I'll show you in a second what I mean by uncompensated surfaces. But what I mean by that is that the magnetic moment of the surface should be non-zero. That's what an uncompensated surface. It should be zero for compensated surface. Since this is like applying an internal field, it should be always negative. And all magnetic materials known to men have a symmetric reversal. So the surprise, here is the big surprise. It already comes in here. I don't know why every, every time somebody goes on, it kind of plays with my... Okay, so here it is the surprise. So here it is, as I told you, a very comprehensive study. We can do 110, 101, and 001. Notice the 110 surface, which I showed you before, is a fully compensated, magnetically, magnetically compensated sur uh, surface. It has as many... Uh, spins pointing into the board as pointing out of the board. So it's zero magnetic moment. The zero, zero, 001 surface is fully uncompensated. It has lots of moments. All the moments are pointing in one direction. And let me just show you what the result of the exchange bias of this system it is. So here it is the exchange bias as a function of temperature for the 110 and the 001, never mind the 101. I, that, I, that's the same fits in this. The fully compensated surface has the maximum exchange bias. And the fully uncompensated surface has zero exchange bias. Totally unexpected. And this was uh, totally crazy to do this because I was told that we shouldn't be doing this. Now, if you field cool this, remember the way we do this experiment, we field cool uh, below the nail temperature, the hysteresis loop, in fact, is true. It goes to negative values. So there it is, the hysteresis loop of, let's say, iron, uh, uh, iron uh, fluoride. Uh, and um, it's, uh, it's uh, shifted towards negative values. Now, let me cool it in a bigger field, which shouldn't do anything. And if I cool it in a bigger field, the, the, the hysteresis loop shifts towards the right. So it depends on the cooling field. It's not as simple as uh, Michael John and Binet thought. And in fact, if you pull it in an intermediate field, you have two hysteresis loops. Okay, so it's complicated. 
Okay, now the reason that this happens is because the magnetic moment of the surface happens to the external field, which is actually something that nowadays is used for, uh, it will probably be used for uh, what is called antiferromagnetic spintronics, but I will not tell you about that yet. There's another thing is that if, if you try doing longitudinal and transverse smoke, what you discover is the following, is if you do, if you do longitudinal and transverse smoke, this was a technique that we actually a long time ago kind of uh, developed and then, then, uh, we are, then later on we applied it to this thing. So there it is, for instance, the longitudinal magnetic moment that measures the magnetic moment M along the field direction. And so you can see here that if you measure the magnetic moment along the field direction, there it is the magnetic moment, the care rotation as a function of field. And depending on whether it's perpendicular polarized or parallel polarized, whether it's P polarized or S polarized, the, the, the hysteresis loop reverts, but there's something very weird that happens here. There is a step in one side of the hysteresis loop and there is no step in the other side. Remember, I told you that all magnetic materials known to men have symmetric reversal. There is nothing that distinguishes up from down. But here there is something that distinguishes up from down. And in fact, if you look at the transfer smoke, you discover the very same thing. There is a, at some intermediate angle, there is a step. If you look at the, at the, at the, magnet, at the care rotation, in one side of the loop, there is a care rotation in the perpendicular direction. So what this means is that the magnetic moment of this exchange bias material in the left hand side it rotates in the right hand side it just reverts by by domain wall motion okay so so the 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 the, the property is not symmetric with respect to field like all magnetic material so what i told you is that what one would like what one would expect is that the, the moment should be maximum for uncompensated surfaces. That's wrong. It should be zero for compensated surfaces. It's wrong. It should be negative. That's wrong. And the reversal should be symmetric. Anything that the old guys told me, now I'm one of those old guys, was wrong. So it's all wrong. So what I'm trying to motivate is you young guys, look at everything that anybody like me tells you and evaluate it and see if it makes sense to you. Are there any questions at this stage of the game? I would like to open up uh, uh, if anybody has any questions. Yes? Hello? Can everybody still follow what I'm talking about here? Or there is Easy. nobody on the other side? Can somebody yeah, call? No, one, one question, um, Ivan. This, uh, when, you, when you talk about uh, surfaces with compensated and uncompensated spins, you need to assure that the roughness is uh, very small, isn't it? How does yes, roughness yeah. affect this uh, assessment? You're, you're absolutely right. And so the question is, how does the roughness, and you're right, even that is wrong, okay? Because you would expect that the compensated surface, if it has some magnetic moment, if you add roughness to it, then it uncompensates the surface, therefore it should make the exchange bias bigger. And it does exactly the opposite. So you're absolutely right. I didn't want to add it into this list here because it's even, it just adds to the list of what everything that is wrong. I, did I answer your question? Hello? Did I answer your question? Sorry, yes, 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 you did. Thank you. Okay, so, so what I told you, um, uh, uh, why is this so complicated? The reason that this is complicated because clearly the effect has to come from what are called the pinned, I mean, the, the, the effect has to come through the interface somehow. I don't know how, but somehow it has to come through the interface, obviously. And so there have to be some pinned, some moments which are stuck, pinned, nailed down, uncompensated spins at the surface, although the surface nominally is compensated, but there is some defects. And so there, there have to be some pinned uncompensated moment at the interface, and then, those are the ones that give origin to all this. And so that's what I want to tell you a little bit about it, very little, I'm not gonna tell you a lot about it. So the question that you want to ask, okay, I told you that the, 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 the effect is transmitted clearly through the interface, but is this a purely interface or is it a bulk effect? 
And so we did a lot of work, and I'll show you just one very striking piece of work. Uh, but we did neutron and synchrotron scattering, we made nanostructures, there is theory behind this also, and there is all kind of fast time, time uh, uh, issues. I will just leave you with the, with, the, with the, again, just to emphasize to you that because the situation is this the way it is, there is no prediction so far, so far as I can tell, anybody can predict new, new systems, which are the, the important new systems. So let hey, me... Yes. Excuse me. Uh, we have a question. Is there uh, a, depends a dependence on the layer thickness? Yes, there is a dependence of the layer thickness because it's an interfacial effect, and so somehow the interface plays a role. So if you the ferromagnetic material becomes very thick, then the whole effect goes away. So this exchange bias phenomenon is only for very thin layers. It also depends on the thickness of the antiferromagnet, and that one. It's a tricky question to answer because it may be that if you make the layers very thin, it either the, 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 the disorder in the antiferromagnet becomes very big or that the antiferromagnetic property gets lost because in very thin layers. And that's not yet clarified, actually. So what happens when you make an anti? in my opinion? Now, I can tell you that the, 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 the world is full of people that think that they can make perfect layers. I cannot. For 40 years in my life, I've been working in this field. No, no, nothing that I do is perfect. Like in fact, when I wake, you guys look at me now and you think this guy is absolutely perfect. Well, I wake up every morning and my wife looks at me and says, you know what, you're not perfect. Okay, so I just want to emphasize this to you. Nothing is perfect and keep this in mind, okay? And always consider this. Okay, thank you. Now, now what I will tell you now is that it's confirmed by Merzbauer and Singleton studies. So let me just show you a very simple experiment. I will take a nickel layer, which is a ferromagnet. I put this iron fluoride, and we did this with manganese fluoride, cobalt fluoride also, and I put permalloy on top of it, okay? So I have two magnetic materials, and they, they, there is an exchange bias at this interface, and there's an exchange bias at that interface, okay? That's what I'm gonna show you. It's a very simple experiment. So ferromagnet, anti-ferromagnet, ferromagnet layer. So there it is. So suppose I do this experiment, and I orient the magnetic moment of the bottom layer to the right, and the top layer to the right, and I measure the magnetic moment of the nickel, okay, the exchange bias of the nickel. So if I measure, the, now the way I do this, I can do it with, uh, with magneto-optic care effect, and that's why we do it. So I can measure the magnetization of this nickel layer as a function of temperature, and uh, lo and behold, it, what happens is what I told you about, the nickel, as ex an exchange bias, the loop is shifted to negative values. It starts at the nail temperature of the antiferromagnet, and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, it starts at the at, at this at, at roughly seventy eight degrees or something like that, and, and 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 it's and it's very big. Okay, so now what I will do is I will revert the magnetic moment to the top layer. If you want to ask me how do I do that, I can explain it to you. But if not, believe me, I can do that. So there it is. So nothing should happen, of course. Uh, what happened here? So what I do is I revert the magnetic moment of the permalloy with respect to the nickel. Now notice here, the nickel is very far away. It's 200 nanometers away. It's a long distance away from the, from the material there. Very long distance, okay, away. And if I do that, something fantastic happens, something totally unexpected happens, as I told you before. What the unexpected thing that happens is this. There is no exchange bias. The very same material, it knows that the permalloy layer far away, 200 nanometers away, is reversed. What does this mean? That this means that somehow there is some information transmitted through the bulk the bulk of the material plays a role. It's not only the interface. If I do the same thing with the, with the permalloy, guess what? Exactly the same thing happens. Whether, whether the two layers are parallel or the two layers are, are, are anti-parallel to each other, the exchange bias at this interface is different depending on what the bottom layer does. It shouldn't if it would be a purely interfacial effect. Now, this, as I'm telling you, this has been confirmed by many other measurements, but uh, which I don't want to bore you with. Ivan, can I ask yes. you a question? The yes. field cooling process induces exchange bias anisotropy? 
Yeah, the field is the field cooling. Yeah, is the field cooling basically that induces the anisotropy? Of course, yes. Is the cooling is the cooling is the one that is responsible for all this? Of course. Okay. That's thank you. Okay. Definitely. Okay. Now, what I uh, so that, did I answer your question, Felipe? Yes. Okay. Okay. So now this is being confirmed by synchrotron and neutrons and all kind of other measurements. I don't want to. But the bottom line is that the reason that there is a coupling in this bulk is because the defects play a role. And the defects are important, and you can no longer ignore the defects. And unfortunately, in this field, contrary to what you will hear many times from many people, the defects are important. So here it is. Let me show you a compensated surface with some defects on it. And so what happens is that there are some defects on it. Let's say those red things are defected there. You have some spins here, which are the green spins which are pointing in the wrong direction, but because there is some defects there, they can point in the wrong direction. So if you have, let's say five frustrated bonds and three uncompensated moments because of the defects, then you see here you have some, some, uh, some frustrated bonds, some frustrated bonds there, see that this spin points up and this one points up, it doesn't like to do that, but because there are defects, it can do that. And so if you, Look, you eliminate all the uncompensated moments there. There it is, all the uncompensated moments uh, eliminated. The defects are, uh, uh, and now I'm gonna eliminate the defects. And the only spins that are left in the antiferromagnet are those green spins. Those are the spinned uncompensated moments. So notice what I'm telling you there, that there is a bunch of spins that are sitting on the crystal structure of the antiferromagnet because of the defects and they are uncompensated. Then the, but there is a background of antiferromagnetism there, okay? And so therefore, the way to think of this is this is like a ferromagnet that has a low moment because it has very few spins. What I mean by low moment, we can actually calculate it based on the exchange bias is about 5% of the antiferromagnetic moment. Remember always the green spins are spins which are part of the antiferromagnetic lattice, but because of the defects, they are uncompensated. The rest of the spins in the background are still there, but they're fully compensated. They have a high coercivity because in order to rotate the green spin, you not only have to rotate the green spin, but you have to rotate the whole background that there is around it. They have a very high ordering temperature because the ordering temperature of those green spins is not what it would be three spins ordering temperature, it would be what is the ordering temperature of the antiferromagnet. It has a very high anisotropy because again, the anisotropy is given by the anisotropy of the antiferromagnet. It's disordered in some sense, well, it sits on an, on an antiferromagnetic lattice, but it's randomly distributed in that antiferromagnetic lattice. So it is both ordered and disordered. You see, it sits in, in very well-defined lattice points but it is randomly, uh, uh, randomly uh, distributed, okay? And, um, and um, so it's disordered in some sense. It is, uh, it is ordered in some other sense. Oh, I don't know why this thing again. So it sits on the regular antiferromagnetic lattice and the coupling between these spins, between these green spins, what orders them magnetically is not their interaction, is not their exchange interaction, is not their dipolar interaction, is the interaction through this medium, which is the antiferromagnetic medium. So this is some kind of a new type of a ferromagnet. I'm not, it's an antiferromagnetic mediated ferromagnet. I'm not sure if, you know, so I'm not really sure 100% if this concept is of any use or not. But, uh, but uh, uh, this is what evolves out of these studies. So the, 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 most, the, 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 the one thing that is definitely important here is that defects are important. You cannot forget about defects. Okay, now whether this concept of, a, of an antiferromagnetically mediated ferromagnet is a useful concept or not, I'm not sure. And that's probably to be debated. So the fundamental issues are these, that the pinned uncompensated spins in these materials are due to defects and you can no longer ignore it. Now, I don't want to tell you about the, the fast time dependence, but there is domains in the saturated states, which I cannot tell you. 
And what I what I uh, uh, what I uh, uh, alluded to is that if you want to predict what new systems will do, that I think nobody has been able to do until now. And so, how universal is all this that I'm telling you? I'm not hundred percent sure, but it's certainly been checked in a system that has all the properties that are needed to check it. It, it has different antiferromagnets, different anisotropies, different ferromagnets. And we think that we somehow are evolving at some kind of an understanding. And the key to this is this business of having defects at, uh, in the antiferromagnet. And there are these domains in the antiferromagnet. You can see that if there is a domain in the antiferromagnet, then that's what couples one layer like those that are three layer system that I showed you to another layer, because there is these domains in the antiferromagnet that matter of this new type of ferromagnetic material. So uh, I will leave you with this, uh, with this uh, PowerPoint and then I would be happy to answer some more questions and I'm right on time. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Very nice talk. Uh, the session is open for questions. We have uh, one question from YouTube. Avilo Velasquez asked, um, have ever you used induced anisotropy? I am I'm not sure what, what do you mean by that? What I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you can you repeat the question, please? Or, or... have you ever used uh, induced anisotropy? Have I ever used induced anisotropy? I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that question. I don't know. Somebody clarify that. What what do you actually mean by that? Okay, let me see. Uh, we have um, another questions. What will it happen in a core shell nanostructure called ferromagnet shell disorder layer and one interface antiferromagnetic layer? Uh, will the exchange bias be observed? Be the the exchange bias be? No, I don't understand. The, the exchange bias is observed in a core shell nanostructure? Yes, there is, there is actually, there is a lot of work that has been done in core shell nanostructures, uh, exchange bias. There has been a lot of work done on that. Most of the work that has been done, actually there's a whole group in, uh, in, uh, in Barcelona that has been doing this kind of work. There's at least two groups in Barcelona that are doing that. One group is uh, uh, Arancha Sanchez, uh, Arancha uh, Sanchez, uh, Arancha, no, not Arancha Sanchez, Arancha, uh, uh, Arancha Rodriguez, and Xavi Batley, and Amilcar Labarta, and there is another one, Josep Nogues, uh, 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 at the different institutions. In, so there is a lot of work on, on core nanostructures. The point that I was trying to make here is that the exchange bias in this system that we are working on is very, very big. So one thing that you have to be a little bit careful is that if you look at exchange bias, where the shift of the hysteresis loop is much, much smaller than the coercive field. That one, you know, it, it has all kinds of uh, problems. These particular systems that I showed you, the, the, the exchange bias is much bigger than the coercive field. So therefore, clearly, there is an exchange bias. Many of the core shell structures have a very small exchange bias, but there is a lot of work on that. So. Those names in as these people in Barcelona, you should look at uh, look, uh, Jordi Sort is another name that you may want to look for. Okay, thank you. We have another question. Can you quantify the number of defects that you need to create the observed exchange bias? Yes, that one I, I alluded to that. That is actually in my earlier PowerPoint right there. It's five percent. It's five percent based on you know you know what how much is uh, the moment, and you can you can actually estimate it. It's about the order of five percent. Okay, thank you. There's there are there, there are any questions from YouTube? Anyone? Eva, I just have a comment. Yes. Um do are, are we like um, in trouble now until we have perfect structure, we won't be able to fully understand the effects? No, I think I think that the, the thing is that the effects are not not, uh, I mean, if you want to, I, mean, I think we understand the effect. I mean, I think that well, in my opinion, the, the, the effect is due to defects and the defects are important. They play a very important role and you cannot just, I mean, it's an, in a, it's, let me put it this way. In physics, a lot of people want to strive towards perfection. 
And my opinion is that instead of striving towards perfection, is to live with your imperfections. Embrace the defects, don't fight them. And they give rise to very interesting effects. This exchange bias is a very interesting effect, which is also happens to be useful. Instead of fighting the defects, embrace it. Why, why, I mean, why, why is it, uh, why you spend all the time in trying to understand some perfect material that is practically impossible to construct? But yes, if you all you want is to understand how perfect materials work, then you have to make perfect materials, of course. But I'm saying okay. defects are very important and not only on this field. I, I would say that this thing, and this has been one of my diatribes for many years, is that you cannot just ignore the defects and instead of fighting the defects, you should embrace the defects. In fact, I have a talk like that. It's called embrace the defects, do not fight them. Okay, thank you. We have another question. Cesar Londoño asks, are there some experimental way to control the defects in interface? Yes, there are. And, 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 and we are trying to do so. Yes, there is a, there's a variety of ways. Well, one way of doing it is to, to grow things, right? You can grow things and grow it at different temperatures and try, but you have to characterize it. That's my point. But yes, that's one way. There's another way to do it, which is actually we have done some experiments like that. And you may want to consider that, and that's a very good controllable experiment, is you can irradiate the materials with ions. And when you irradiate the material with ions, you can produce defects in a controllable fashion. And you can produce, not only you can produce defects in a controllable fashion, you can produce them at different depths. So there is this way of producing uh, defects at different depths. And this has a very important uh, sort of consequences for many of these, uh, for the physics of many of these materials, this type of materials, not only exchange bias, but, uh, but uh, giant magnetic resistance and uh, interfaces between uh, between uh, ferromagnets and metal insulator transitions and uh, and so on so so yes there is a way to control that and and that's that's uh, that's a very interesting um, sort of uh, uh, direction to go into thank you okay another questions okay ah from YouTube, I'll leave you. External magnetic field like earth field could induce exchange anisotropy? Uh, okay, well, that's a good question. <laughs> Actually, mm -hmm. the external magnetic field, the earth field is usually very, very small. It's so so it, it generally doesn't, uh, it doesn't induce much anisotropy, I think. Uh, I mean, typically the magnetic fields that are applied here are kind of, comparable to the ordering or the coercive fields, which are of the order of 100 Gauss or something like that. And so therefore, therefore um, they probably are not, but in, in maybe, I mean, I, I, nobody's ever asked me this question. So that's why I'm a little bit at a loss of words, but maybe it is, maybe one should consider that because of the following, the, the, the ordering of the ferromagnet is, there is no such a thing as zero field, of course. It's always, there is some field. And depending on what is the magnetic structure of the ferromagnet, that may affect the magnetic structure of the antiferromagnet. And therefore, when you're cooling it down, the antiferromagnet doesn't cool like as if it would be in zero field. It cools like as if it would be in a finite field. So maybe there is some effects of, uh, of the Earth's magnetic field, although that's very small, so I'm not exactly sure. But let me put it this way. Certainly the domain structure of the ferromagnet, we had a very recent paper like uh, half a year ago or something with Rafael Morales in which we showed that the ferromagnetic, the structure, the domain structure in the ferromagnet affects the antiferromagnet, affects the exchange bias. Okay. So I'm not sure I answered your question, but uh, you know. Uh, um. Anyone? Okay, I think we already done. Yeah, um, I suppose some, someone could take a picture. We turn on our camera. Is, uh, no. Oh, there is another question. Yeah. From Ramos Guevara. 25 to 26 micro Tesla. Oh no, it's a comment, sorry. I don't see anything. Okay. Anyone? Kike? 
some questions? May I ask a question, Felipe? Uh, mm -hmm. Why is this um, theoretical prediction so elusive, so so difficult? That, I mean, where, where should theoreticians look to understand and predict uh, this phenomenon? <laughs> That's a, that's a very, very good question. And, uh, and uh, it, 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 let me just tell you that this, that question is very similar that you would ask in a superconductor, right? In a superconductor, <laughs> nobody can predict the new superconductor. And no matter how much, it is full of theories. You know, there's probably more theories than there are physicists in, in superconductivity. And nobody's ever predicted a new superconductor. It was always found by some accident. This is kind of the same. Now, why, why is this? Uh, that's a very good question. But do you have a feeling where, where should people I should look? It's because at... it's not realized that you have to intrinsically worry about the defects. I think that's the, the thing is that everybody tries to kind of predict it based on some perfect interfaces and some perfect this and perfect that. And then that's not what gives rise to this effect. I think that's the, that's at the, at the and, and so I can tell you this domain state model that came out of Germany, Günterod and Novak, and uh, I think it's Novak. Uh, that actually is a, is a good model that, uh, that at least explains the data. I'm not sure it can predict new, new materials, but, uh, but, but so what I would do now, you know, that's difficult to do. I, I, I can tell you that I'm working on something similar to that, not in exchange bias, but in uh, metal insulator transition, is what is the effect of defects? And everybody says, well, do density functional theory, okay? I mean, I'll tell you that that is not an easy problem to do, for instance, density functional theory with defects. And I think that's where the, 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 the problem is, that it, the realization that you have to, that you cannot avoid defects and that you have to fight them somehow. You have to embrace them somehow and somehow include them in your theories. I think Thank you very much. I, I enjoyed uh, uh, very, very much your, your talk. Very much. So, anyone? Okay, please, a virtual applause for Professor Ivan Schuller. Thank you so much. Very nice talk. Thank you. <laughs> so, the picture, right? Yeah. I don't know how to take a picture. Well, you can, you can just, uh, a screenshot. Yes. Yeah, let, let's see, maybe I, I should stop sharing. Yeah, you should stop your, your presentation. Okay. Did I stop sharing or no? No. no. It's still there. My, my, uh, the problem is that <laughs> this thing disappears. I don't know where, my, where my floating, my floating, uh, my floating thing disappears uh, and I cannot stop the sharing. I don't know how to stop the sharing. Let me see if I can. can uh, does anybody know how to find the flow? Oh, there it is. Okay, yeah, now. It's okay. Yes. Okay, so whoever is taking, take a screenshot. But the, 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 unfortunately, the screenshot is not going to have everybody in it. Okay. I, I can take this. Uh... I mean, actually, let me just say one thing. If you want to know the theoretical reasons for why not, I, I just see the man in front of me here who knows everything about this. And I should have mentioned his name, which is my old professor, Miguel Kiwi. He is the guy who, <laughs> so he can tell you why theories cannot predict new systems. Ask him, actually. He was my professor. Everything I know, I learned from him. So, you know, <laughs> I would go to him to ask him also. <laughs> the, it's obvious to me not to, but uh, the, the problem is that you, for a theory to be right, you have to include all what Ivan has been saying, all the defects, all the, and you don't know exactly how the interface structure is. For example, you have the problem that uh, the iron or nickel on iron fluoride, there is no way, no simple way to make a model where you have epitaxial growth. So, it, the growth on one on top of the other is very, very complex. If there is a unit cell, it must be enormously big and therefore you cannot calculate. And on top of it, you have pinnate spins, you have defects, you don't know exactly how the 
the crystallography of the structure is, so there are so many unknowns that make a theory absolutely impossible. Well, no, not absolute, one never should say impossible, but very, very difficult. You have to take into account an, an enormous number of uh, things, and especially the defects on which Ivan has been insisting, not only in this talk, but for many, many years, and I think that's the right election. But, but let me say this, Miguel, to you, uh, which is the following. I learned a long time ago from somebody that taught me my first solid state physics course that solids are very complicated. They are extremely complicated. They have defects. They have all kinds of things. But we can understand solids by looking at one electron in a box. <laughs> and when I was learning that as an undergraduate from some random professor at the university, I thought, this guy is nuts. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I mean, how can you possibly, what is this one electron in a box? There is 10 to the 23 electrons and there is no box, <laughs> okay? And what, lo, lo and behold, you can understand the, more or less the properties of solids by one electron in one box. So maybe there is some kind of a theory of some sort that can allow us to do that. I mean, look, you can figure out whether copper is a metal and silicon is a semiconductor by understanding one electron in a box. So maybe there is a way, like it has to be some clever young guy that comes up with this thing. So I give yeah. it as a homework to people. <laughs> now yeah, that I'm of your age, Miguel. Yeah, I know. There's much to be done. And so all the younger people have a lot of work to do. Yeah, yeah. And then they should go back to work as opposed to, you know, trying to hide behind the COVID. <laughs> 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 okay thank you so much okay thank you so much for your participation i take a picture someone have a comment no you, you take a picture with the uh, i did screen. i did take a screenshot i did ah okay so we're done thank you ivan thank you everyone thank you very much for inviting See me you. Thank you. Bye. Great Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Great talk. Very good. Chandra <laughs> Leon. Pablo, ¿cómo estás? ¿Qué decís, si Quique, tanto tiempo? ¿Cómo sabía que te estaba mirando a vos? Disculpa, no. eh, Miguel, ¿podés parar la presentación por YouTube, por favor? Listo, Diego.